why decide to dedicate your energy to matcha, at least in part? Well, let me say on the second day that I was in Japan back in, in uh, November of 1959, my host mother took me next door to meet her neighbor who was a tea ceremony practitioner. So the three of us sat around and this woman did a tea ceremony and presented me with a bowl of matcha. And I was completely taken by it, first by the color, uh, also by the cha sen, the whisk, which I just thought was marvelous. And the taste of it, I fell in love with it. So I began, when I began going to Japan more regularly in the 1970s, every time I was there, I'd bring matcha back to the States and turn people onto it. No, nobody had ever heard of it here. And I just thought this was a great thing to make available. This was before I knew anything about its health benefits. And I partnered with a matcha company in Japan and began selling it through my website. Again, like the Beneficial Plant Association, way ahead of its time. Uh, this was in the 1980s. And uh, you know, I just always thought this would be a great thing here. So when I had the chance, when I saw matcha becoming popular here, it bothered me that so few people had access to good matcha because if if matcha is not prepared correctly and if it's not stored correctly, it oxidizes very quickly because it has such a huge surface area and it turns, it loses that bright green color, it loses the good flavor, has a bitter taste and many people here had never tasted really good matcha. So I was determined to make that available and that's why I started this company and we got, the great coup was getting the URL matcha.com. People in <laughs> Japan can't believe that we got that, but there it is. Let's discuss the health benefits. And let me also just ask a question for myself. I would imagine most people who listen to this and have had tea before, they imagine tea leaves or a tea bag put into water, you steep, and then you remove the tea leaves and you're left with this colored water and that is what you drink. But matcha is, if, if I'm understanding correctly, whole leaf. So if it would, there would also be an incredible importance, or you could place incredible importance on quality or sourcing in so much as if you're consuming whole leaf tea that has been exposed to pesticides, you're going to be getting a much higher toxin load as well. Is that, am I thinking about that correctly? You are, and there is organic matcha available, but not nearly as in great supply as conventional matcha. But we've monitored matcha for pesticide levels and are assured that this is not, not a problem. But the way matcha is grown, how it's prepared, it's a long labor-intensive process. And um, matcha is the only form of tea in which the whole leaf is consumed, as you say. I think we have the most research on the health benefits of green tea in general. And there are many forms of green tea that I like. But matcha has the highest level of antioxidants and of L-theanine, the calming mm -hmm. amino acid that modifies the effects of caffeine. So it's mm -hmm. unique in that regard. And I think there are health benefits of matcha that are distinctive among all forms of tea. How does L-theanine modify the effects of caffeine? I think it, it takes the jittery edge off of caffeine. Mm -hmm. I think the effects of caffeine in tea and in coffee are very different. Coffee produces, I think, a jangling effect in many people. There's often a crash after a period of stimulation. Uh, many coffee drinkers are physically addicted to it and have a withdrawal syndrome when they stop. You don't see anything like that with, with tea. And I think some of that is because the L-theanine has a calming effect that, that changes the effect of caffeine. And as I say, matcha has more L-theanine in it than any other form of tea. Why is that? Is it that it's contained in some of the fibrous components of the leaf that are discarded when it's prepared? No, I think it has to do with the way the tea is grown because what's unique about uh, matcha is that about three weeks before harvest, the plants are sh heavily shaded hmm. with shade cloth that cuts out about 70, 80% of the sunlight. And in response to that, the leaves grow bigger and thinner and produce higher amounts of antioxidants and L-theanine. So I think that's very unique. There's some, the same shading process is used to make uh, a very high quality brewed green tea called Gyokuro that, that I'm sure yeah. you're familiar with. It's quite delicious. Mm -hmm. So that also has these high levels. That's fascinating to me. So it almost seems like an adaptive stress response by the plant to fortify exactly, itself. Right. 
Well, it's trying to get, it makes more leaf surface in an effort to get more, you know, light exposure and it yeah. develops more chlorophyll, which accounts for the bright color of, of matcha. So I don't know how the Japanese discovered this shading process, but it is unique. And for people who have not seen, even if you never have matcha, I certainly would suggest that you consider it. But even if you're never going to drink matcha, go find photographs of exceptionally good matcha. The color is Amazing. unlike anything yeah. else you yeah. have ever seen in your life. <laughs> it is like a phosphorescent, almost a phosphorescent green. And I'm biased because green is my favorite color. But oh, good. <laughs> it really is. It really is something something special. Can I say that uh, matcha curry, I think, has some of the finest matcha available. We're very particular about our sourcing. And listeners to your podcast can get a generous discount if they use the code TIM. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a listener exclusive, folks. So oh, there you go, code TIM. And that's easy to remember, matcha.com, M-A-T-C-H-A.com. 